Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 100-Year Real Estate Investor. We're your hosts, Jake and Gino, and this is the show dedicated to long-term personal financial engineering. Gino, how's it going? Jake, I am doing good today. We know our guest is doing that today. We have a very special guest. Our guest today is the president and CEO of Coaching International. He helps entrepreneurs make a ton of money and create businesses that they can actually sell. That's an interesting idea there. So without further ado, Sean McGinnis, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jake and Gino. Great to be with you both. It is our pleasure. Let's get started. Let's get to know each other a little bit and, and hear about how you got started in business. So pretty simple story. I You hear by my accent, I'm not from around these parts. I'm South African of origin. Oh, I was in Brooklyn, I thought, but okay. I got you. So, no. <laughs> That's what a very good yeah. friend of mine says. When are you going to not fake your accent, Sean? But no, I started out working after college for, a, would say, one of South Africa's top entrepreneurs who had his hand in a number of different businesses. And he sat me down one day and he said, you can either work for me your entire life, or you can leverage a talent that I see in you. And you're a great influencer. You're exceptional at business development. Come and work for me for a couple of years. And then if you've got game, spread your wings. And so I took him up on that challenge. I worked for him for two and a half years. Uh, his name is Robert Maingard, an amazing guy. And he put me in a number of different businesses. And I discovered that I had a real talent for connecting with people, uh, for sales. I was in industrial sales and commercial sales to begin with in my career. And then I started to gravitate towards really understanding the professional services end and side of the business. So two and a half years later, I sat down with Robert and he said, okay, you ready? I said, yeah, I'm ready. And I'm gonna immigrate and I'm gonna start my own business. I was 25, I went to Canada. I uh, started a business in the psychometric testing, organizational development and executive search space. I built my first business up over 14 years. I sold it in 2003. I then collaborated with a ex-top uh, CFO executive from Citigroup. We raised $100 million. We built several thousand homes through a construction finance revolver in Mexico. And then I got recruited um, to probably the best hired gun role. I was an entrepreneur, two-time, two-time successful with bumps along the way, as we all have. And then I got recruited to help run the Young Presidents Organization, YPO, which is probably the finest and longest lasting peer-to-peer -peer executive organization in the world. It's 75 years old this year. So this topic of long-termism is so in my DNA and I was their president and chief operating officer. We, we, we operated in 124 countries, 33,000 CEOs, amazing people. I learned so much. And the contributions I received were way in excess of what I put in. And it gave me perspective. So I think from my career, I was able to see a vision. Robert painted a vision because in my very early days, he'd been through the ups and downs, but he created this massive um, series, uh, sources of income and businesses and people. I got so inspired by that at an early age. And that's what prompted me to think long term. Wow. Two-time winner as an entrepreneur to CEO of YPO. Talk about that transition because it sounds like even though CEO of YPO, you're driving the ship, was it a different format and structure since it was already an established organization that you were coming into? Great question. So I was president and COO. We had a CEO who spent gotcha. most of his time with the board. But yes, it was a, you know, from being an entrepreneur to going to a hired gun yes. um, is difficult because you have to give up the power and control that you had in your in my previous business. I was the guy. I was the decision maker. I was the one with game. Now we had a board of 20 people, each one of them an independent CEO in their own right with amazing game. We had a CEO who was extraordinary, and then me, and then we had you know um, our management teams, and that's over 500 people. What really made a difference is Scott, the CEO, Scott Mordell and I sitting down and having a very frank, candid discussion about role clarity. We do this with our clients at CEO Coaching because a lot of entrepreneurs are, they muddle and meddle in all parts of the business, and they don't really clearly understand that it and in certain instances, they've got to step out of the way and let other people do the work that they are competent and capable in. So before I even started, Scott and I sat down and we each had an article that we, that we pulled together. Mine was called Leading from the Second Chair. I'd never been a number two. 
So I had to learn to lead from the second chair. It's kind of got a, a more of a spiritual component to it. <laughs> His article was, okay, how do we, where are we not going to cross paths? So what are you accountable for? Where are your authorities? Where are mine? So I didn't muddle um, or get involved in the board issues or, you know, managing HR. I had all of the business, I had two thirds of the PNL and all of the business functions. And so having that clarity from day one and then being supported by Scott and the board to be able to do my job in the best way I can with resources, with clarity, with really great goals. Without that, I think it would have been a struggle. And it may, you know, it took me about a year to kind of, I, I'd been a YPO member, by the way, for eight years. And I've been a member now for 16 years. So I came with a member mindset. Now I'm being paid to do a job for the members, you know, that previously were my peer group and still are my peer group. So that transition was difficult, but those two things, clarity, conversation, and then regular community. We'd meet every two months for a day. I'd fly to Chicago. We'd rent a room at an airport hotel, and we'd just go through. How are we doing? How are we doing with each other? How are we doing in our lanes? What's working? What isn't working? We did that for seven and a half years. Wow. That medium is just uh, crucial. And uh, you know, as, as, as Gino and myself are growing as entrepreneurs, We've had that struggle in the past. And I think if you're not on your cadence, you're not allowing for that time and that open dialogue and, and asking questions, as we've learned, uh, instead of dictating, things can get a little messy. So it sounds like um, he was very experienced. You guys had clear objectives in the beginning, and Correct. it prevented those sort of power struggles and issues from someone coming from entrepreneurship two times leading the ship to then having to take, I don't want to take, you know, back seat, but you're going to have other accountabilities now where you're not just going to be able to say, this is the direction and we're going. So that's really yeah. impressive to hear. And, you know, listen, the reality of life creeps in. You are, you are ultimately going to find a situation where the two of you, independent of each other, do something that the other is mainly responsible for. The key is to regroup, communicate, and if it needs to be a candid or tough conversation, give each other the permission to have that with the bigger picture in mind. And so, you know, if you've got, if you've got a really well articulated goal, one year out, two years out, five years out, because the one constant we all face, and we know this, and a lot of CEOs struggle with this, is the biggest con constant in life is change. Look at the look at the disruption and change we're in right now. It's it's probably in my lifetime the most change I've ever experienced ever in a three-year period. And it and it seems to just be what about the last six months alone? <laughs> oh my just... gosh. And now our clients, you know, we, yeah. we serve 470 CEOs and their companies at yeah. CEO Coaching International. They're all highly capable uh, business executives in their own right. But what you know, what we find works for them is having an accountability partner, a coach that they can have a conversation with, that they can't have with their spouse. They can't have it with their direct reports. They've got to be able- It's lonely. We, There's nobody there for them. It's lonely. And who do you have a conversation with where you can be vulnerable? I mean, let's face it, the three of us, you guys are partners. I'll ask you a question. Are you both 100% vulnerable with each other? We've only been- To the vulnerable. best of my ability. I'm not a very vulnerable guy. Let's <laughs> Once in our lives. <laughs> But you probably wear, you probably, you know, what? here's the shit though. I'm going to tell you right now, here's the problem. I don't know what it was. It was like two years ago or something. And I came to Gino and I was like, man, we got it. We got it pretty damn good. I mean, you know, this is working, this is working, this is working. And I was just like, man, we got to take a minute to celebrate. And he like bitch slapped me and, and called me a sissy. And so that was the last time I ever opened up to him. So I was like, dude, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to bury my shit deep and never talk to you again. It's That's fine. That's not exactly how it went. It Verbatim. went a bit Except it wasn't a front slap. It was like a backhand and like there's snot and stuff flying out after he whacked it. <laughs> oh, That's funny. So, Sean, you're talking about articulated goals. Can we discuss? Yeah. You know, he asked you a question. What? Well, are, okay. you, are you authentic, Gino? You, 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 you see what you get here. I am, I am as vulnerable as they can come. You know, it's, it's, it's a tough question to answer yeah, because we're supposed to be the leaders. We're not supposed to show any weaknesses. And, and with me and Jake, I think we have that partnership that 
he was struggling. dudes didn't cry in my house just saying well no but listen honestly I'll, I'll give you a perfect example he was struggling a couple weeks ago about hiring somebody he wasn't sure but so who has he come to he came to me we sat down we worked through it we listed the pros and the cons he got it out of his head i did the same thing last week we're hiring an executive assistant jake can you jump on a call with her to see how the how it fits and yes. i have that accountability partner now we just that, that that's how we communicate and when i need something i know he's got another certain obstacles that we may not be able to to uh, overcome because we haven't come to those yet or broached those yet, but we still want to work together in trying to solve those. And it's always good because we have different perspectives. I'm a little bit older than him. I'm a little bit more, I don't want to say coachable, but I have a lot more patience <laughs> And you, you probably and, are and, yeah. and experiences yeah. and maybe yeah. wisdom. I'm putting words in your mouth and I'm not dissing. I'm not dissing you, Jake. No, but, but at the same time, Jake is great when he says, let's get to the point. Let's do this deal. Um, let's fire this person. And it's really good. Sometimes I need to get to that point and I drag it out a little long. So we, I think we end up complimenting each other when it comes to that. But yeah. enough about my vulnerability here, because I'm getting a little, <laughs> getting a little By the way, a good coach always rephrases and gets you to answer questions. So I'm on the spot now. <laughs> well, as far as you said, articulating goals, one of the questions that we love to ask on the show is, you know, what do you do that other people don't? in relation to that long-term thinking. And I think articulating goals, what we can do in one year is overstating what we think we can do. But what we can do in five years is usually understating. So basically we think we can do so much in a year and it doesn't get done. But when you look back and you plan goals for five years and they're articulated, wow, I really can accomplish that. And I have accomplished that. Listen, I think it, it is very important that what we teach and what I do personally is, you know, because of the, the reality that change is a constant, we have a we have a 13 week rhythm that we teach our clients and every week. So firstly, you've got to have your annual goals, two or three that are really important. So for you guys, it's really, you know, it could be for companies, you know, what is the what is the top line growth number I, I need to accomplish this year? What is the EBITDA profit number that I need to actually have to invest in the resources that are going to accomplish the goal? You work out your specific and measurable activities on a quarterly basis that are going to move the needle to accomplish those. So those are those are the business frameworks. Then I also have personal goals. I have a purpose goal. I have a relationship goal. I have a money goal and I have a health goal. So from a business standpoint, it's critical to establish and I call it the growth mindset. And we teach this to our, we coach this to our clients is what do you really want that needs to be identified. What do I need to do to get it? What might get in the way of me getting it? And how will, how will I hold myself accountable to what I've said I'm going to do? That's all part of goal setting, right? Mm -hmm. So those are the foundation questions. And when you develop those questions and outcomes, what are the activities that I'm, I'm going to need to do every week, every quarter, uh, in order to accomplish those? So that gives you... The definition of success it enables you to remove distractions it enables you to stress test because a lot of it if you're coming up with new goals and you're moving into new areas you want to pivot you want to experiment it enables you to evaluate the leadership team we have a very simple thing with goals we've set these goals here are our targets for the year here are our targets for the quarter zero to ten do we have the right person in place to get there so you've just hired an ea i'm sure i hope you're feeling it's a 10 what do they need to be successful? Are they equipped? And if they're not equipped and you're at a seven or eight, what, what does it take to get to a 10? And you should use that very simple question for every goal, for every goal that you have. So goals critical, defining activities behind those goals, and then what are the deliverables? And you could go three years out, you could go five years out. If you don't have that measurement and you're not looking at it uh, monthly and quarterly, I have found in my life, and I see it in our clients, if you don't embrace that level of accountability and discipline, you are not going to achieve what you say you want to achieve. And that's why most people are not successful because there's work involved and it doesn't seem as if it's a, a, a important work. It's that Stephen Covey, which is important 
but not urgent. That quadrant there where most people don't like to sit, they like to sit where they're putting out fires. But what Sean is talking about is really working on yourself and working, uh, you know, on the business, not just not not just in it, but on it. And that's really, really important to, for people to focus on. So thanks for sharing that. But you oh, can you see why, why most people are not. Go back and listen to that, everybody. We spoke a little bit quickly. Take notes on what Sean just talked about and work out and reverse engineer what you need to do. I mean, our growth, our top line growth is 20%. We read the book, Small Giants, and for us in the real estate and the rental space, we'd like to grow you know, revenues at 20%, whether that's acquiring new properties or rental income coming in. So that's just something that we picked up uh, over the last uh, 12 well, months. Well, brilliant. And if your audience is interesting, uh, we have a bestseller art called Making Big Happen. Um, it's It has all of the tools. It has all of the, the tips. It has case studies from our clients. I try and talk to at least six or seven of my of our clients a week. I'm I'm not I don't do the coaching. We have 64 unbelievable coaches. I mean, these are world class CEOs, men and women. So I don't get involved in their business, but I like to, to build relationships. Part of my long term philosophy, and I learned this from Robert, I learned this in my early part of my career, is building relationships that matter is very, very key. So you asked me about my personal goals. I have a relationship goal. Be purposeful about connecting authentically with those that I have chosen to associate with in a meaningful manner. That's my personal relationship goal. And so I try, I'm not perfect at this, but now that, you know, Jake and Gino are my brothers, um, my goal, let's, let's commit. If we can help each other over a period of time, that's important. But I don't surround myself with people that don't have similar pay it forward relationship goals. And it stood me in such good stead. I can't tell you how many times that's come back that I've met somebody 30 years ago and we've, and we've, we've maintained a connection, even if it's once a year or a birthday, hello, and something profound happens that we're able to help ourselves in a moment of need. I want to go back to something Gina was saying about discipline and why people fail. There needs to be tools and systems in place to help you with the accountability and the tracking. Now, it can start off very basic. One of the biggest things that changed my life, I would say going back to 2005, and I've stuck with it ever since. I got this silly card stock that goes with me wherever I go. I have a Google Calendar. I have all this stuff that we all have. But having it with me and crossing them out, having the goals at the top, having the fitness goals at the top, having the personal goals every day, writing those out, and then my, my literally time blocking hour through hour, it's important and it holds me accountable. And I've, I've planned my week out every Sunday since 2005. Sunday, I plan my week out regardless, and it's there. Yes, we have shared Google calendars. We have all this other stuff. We have these tracking you know, uh, devices for our quarterly meetings, our yeah. quarterly priorities and all that. Find out what works for you, though, and hold yourself accountable and don't miss. That's how this stuff gets pulled through with the meeting rhythms, with the cadence of accountability. That's when this stuff will really come together and you'll see a beautiful intersection. I love what you're saying. And I'll share personally what I do because you know, I, it's important to have the business rhythms. It's important to establish a growth mindset, understand playing a game to win, practice, mm -hmm. that makes perfect, inspiration. But personally, I start every day. I start out, what is a message to myself today? So I'll share my message today because I knew I was coming on today. I want to be articulate. I want to be focused and I want to express warmth. That, that was my call out to myself today. Then I literally go through 10 things. This is with my first cup of money, uh, uh, coffee in the morning. And it is money. You money. called it a cup of money. That's <laughs> beautiful. Money, isn't that? That's Freudian, right? Whoa. <laughs> I want a cup of money. <laughs> so How about I just go down I to the basement and get some cash about? later? <laughs> what can I get right. excited about today? If, if there's one word that can describe how I want to be today. So I go through 10 little things. I then have my day clearly planned. I know the, the top three things I'm going to accomplish. One that I must absolutely do. Somebody that I need to inspire and lead well today. And then at the end of the day, I sit down and I do an evening journal. But I only ask, ask, answer six things. I do that every single day. You guys could, you know, if your audience could see, I mean, I am absolutely ruthless and I score myself because that helps me to your point not everybody you know everybody has something different that activates them but this for me has kept me focused successful and on target 
Uh, also, with with the rhythms and the personal habits, um, you want to share your your rhythms or your habits that have also attributed to your values. So you have you know personal things that you do on a daily or weekly basis, but they also sub- support the values that you stand for and believe in before we were talking about how you have dinner with your daughter and your wife every night. And that's more on the personal side of things, but maybe some things on the business growth side that are daily or, or weekly rituals. So on the business growth side, it's really important. And again, this is not, we, we do this. We, um, we eat our own food, so to speak, and our clients do. It's so key to have an articulated vision statement that's got to mm. clearly describe a picture of what your business is going to be look like five to 10 years from today. Is it inspirational? And does it drive everybody in the business, including you as a leader, because you have to live it every day? Does it really inspire you and drive you? The second thing is really understanding the values, working very closely. Like, for example, we have values, you know, integrity is a value, compassion is a value, courage is a value, passion is a value. Commitment is a value. Now, you know, we live those. Our coaches live them. We live them. If you're not aligned in your personal life to at least, you know, a high percentage of those, the chances of you fitting with the culture of the organization is probably not that great. So it's really important that organizations define the values, make sure that people buy into those and it's not just a plaque on the wall, clearly identify what their unique value proposition is, And then once that foundation is there, if you hold yourselves accountable to that, conversations become very real because you can have a conversation with with this in mind. Jake and Gina, we're going to have a courageous conversation today. The performance this quarter has been 60% off on what you said a quarter ago that we were going to accomplish. Would you agree that one of our values is courage? Courage to say what needs to be said. Yes, I agree. So here are my perspectives. I'm open to hear yours. You get that feedback. What you've done is you've framed the conversation based on a value. Candor could be a value that goes with this example. But what you're doing is you're clearing through the clutter because you're now anchoring in something that everybody has said and you've lived is important. That creates a tremendous difference as you build your business. It also, in a very tight labor market, We're in such a tight labor market. Everybody's competing. Salaries have gone through the roof. You guys are probably living this. People don't just want to come for a paycheck. They also want to come to a place where they believe they're having an impact and the values are aligned. And if you're just window dressing and having values for the sake of it, it does more harm than good. But winning making sure that you've got individuals aligned to those values is critical. Company's not living the values. The team members are then going to, you know, call you on it when things aren't going like that. And it starts to get icky and weird for the people that are experiencing on the team. So that's a great point. Yep. John, when did you change? I mean, from that short-term mindset to the long-term mindset, when, when in your career did that, did that occur? You know, it happened probably in the early part of, of, of my, of my first business journey. I was around, 27 or 28 years old, and I was go, go, go. I was in the business, not on the business. And I went to a, um, I went to a, an event uh, w- with a group called the Entrepreneurs Organization, and there was a speaker who literally did this kind of weird exercise. Close your eyes, and I want you to pretend that you're living to 120 years old, And I want you to pretend that you've seen this, you know, incredible arc of innovation and experiences. And and by the way, that at that time, there was no internet. And, you know, we had those huge giant um, mobile phones. Jake probably doesn't remember that. But Gino, you and I lived with those. I mean, you had to carry a suitcase. I've seen them in museums before. (laughs) Jake's seen them in museums. Gino and I actually had one. Um, and so it was an amazing exercise because what it did, and we get our clients to do this, by the way, we get them to visualize what would it look like? What would your business look like? What would your industry look like? If, for example, you could reinvent your business today and create it from scratch, what would it look like? And so at that session, I started picture, picturing myself living till 120, whereas my previous he had you write down before, how old do you think you'd lived to? I think I wrote down 79. 
So imagine adding to 120 and what you could accomplish in that time frame. So I was like, it blew my mind. So I stopped thinking about this. I have to get everything done today. I have to be rich tomorrow. I have to have a BMW next week. I started thinking very differently and I found myself relaxing. I found myself breathing into my life um, and literally not being as concerned about what was going to happen tomorrow because I now had a vision in my mind of living healthily, successfully to 120. And that stayed with me. Mm -hmm. Jake, uh, before you wrap up, I think we I, I need to make this point because what Sean is talking about right now is what most investors are going through right now. They're looking at the next quarter, the next six months for that next deal. When if you stop and take a look back, it's called the market cycle. And this is what we want. Over the last four years, it's been difficult to find deals. Everyone's complaining that there are no deals. Now, all of a sudden, the market's shifted. We may go into recession. I think we've been in a recession for the last two years. But now everyone's complaining that, oh, we're going to go into recession. I can't buy deals. So I think if you adopt a long-term mindset, you'll be able to buy deals in any part of the market cycle. And you're not worried about what we call the get there you're not going exactly. to be exactly you're, you're not going to be risking getting into a bad deal because you're going to say if i miss this deal there will be a next one all the stars have to align and this deal needs to make sense for me if not it's okay i can pass on this one and i can go to the next one and i think that's what's really important i think as one component of the long term is in what you've been talking about because the get there right is very very difficult especially for this this generation that we're in even for us that are a little bit older we're so yeah. used to getting things i mean you get something in amazon you get it the next day uh and it's very hard to put things off and i got jake give me the finger bro talk to me well brother. no because i want to i want to piggyback off this and ask a, a direct question to sean here because what we see especially with the younger guys that come in either on the acquisition side or the sales side it's it's a combination of the get their itis and they're going against the company's values in order to generate something either coming in a sale or, or a new acquisition or it's the shiny object syndrome where if they're having a bad couple of weeks they're like well maybe we got to be doing this or maybe we got to be doing this what do you say to those guys? Because we see it really in the younger folks coming in where they're just so hungry to get there. They, they can't see really through the forest and like the Ray Dalio thing, the diamond on the other side of the, the forest at the top of the mountain. They're just, they're just trying to get there immediately. So what, what's your, what do you say? So I have two things. One, you obviously want them at the cold face and you want them to be successful. You want them to do all of those detailed, specific and measurable activities. So if they've got to generate 30 new leads a day, if they've got to reach out to 100 people a week, if they've got to set five sales calls, those you don't want to change because those are the replicable, sustainable mm -hmm. and measurable activities. Part of that is we know, all three of us, the, the cyclical nature of business and sales. Different businesses are impacted differently. You've got you know, businesses that are impacted by, you know, vacations, holidays, the tsunami, the supply chain, the, the lack of good M&A deals, cash, there's all those elements that you've got to think about. But for those young people, having a mentor is very important. The caliber of your salesperson manager needs to be able to, through experience, say, I've been there. Chill out. If you're doing your activities, <laughs> it's going to happen. I call it the fizzle grab. And every day, it's like, think of, Think of a moving EKG health monitor thing up. You're going to be and every day. Every salesperson is going to go through the highs and lows of the fizzle graph. The manager's role, the mentor's role is to teach them how to deal with that. When they start to be despondent, they start to cut corners. They want to cheat. They want to put a knife in somebody else's back and steal their lead. Guys, that's not how we play the game. If you're doing these specific and measurable things, you will succeed. And I'm not going to beat you up. As long as you're doing those and you're being upfront with me and you're collaborating and we're a team and I'm going to hold you accountable to that and I'm going to mirror and manage that, I think you can get through that. But you've got to inspect it. And, you know, there's a lot of BS that comes in and complaining and excuses from people. Mm -hmm. Listening to that is important, but interrupting that and saying, okay, you know, Tomorrow, the last hour is gone. Whatever you're doing right now is important. Do well what you're doing right now with a disciplined approach. And you can apply this to any role. And let's see what results you get. And I'm not going to fire and beat you up. If, if I see 
that you're putting in the effort because it will translate into into wins for you. You know, you get the highs and the lows throughout the day, but we need you to have emotional steadiness like this. Emotional as we grow steadiness. <laughs> and by the way, that's also fit, right? That's making sure you've got the yes. right people in the right seats. Doing a doing a disc profile or a TTI yeah. on somebody, making sure you know what the buttons are on the trigger points, because if you've got somebody that you know is really good with people, you know is really is really great at the at the interface, but they poor in uh, administration, you've got to make sure that you backfill that and you and you help them. So, ninety percent of what they're doing on a on a daily basis is suited to their competence, their desire. We call it a combination of will and skill, and then properly supported and managed, you've got a successful employee. It, it, it's funny that you brought that up because uh, they, they got to be a fit. And one of our managers, I was having a uh, call with her uh, this morning, and she said, I'm seeing this thing with the folks that are not working out. And they're all, I, I think she said ENFTJs or something like that. So, you know, I, I don't know it as intricately as, as she does, but I, I said, well, listen, from now on, we don't hire ENFTJs then because <laughs> and listen, and they tend to be psycho. <laughs> exactly right. You're doing them a favor too, because yeah. if they're not suited, it's not a win-win for either party. 100%, 100%. Wow. This has been some really impactful stuff. Are there any other comments uh, before we sign off today on how long-termism, long-term planning uh, has impacted your businesses. I just want to make sure that we uh, we leave no stones unturned here before we sign off. You know, I will I will share I will share one thing, and yeah. it's a lesson that has come you know over a long period of time. Everything we do in our lives and our businesses is interconnected. Hmm. None of us is an island. None of us. None of us would be where we are if it wasn't for being able to be mentored, standing on somebody's shoulders, having a lucky break, um, and so, and, and experience struggles. Now, think of our role in this world in terms of long-termism, all our ancestors. I have a picture on my wall of my, my grandmother and her 10 daughters, all of whom are dead, but all of whom, I've got 32 first cousins, all of whom are living a life, all of whom have a legacy, all of whom, you know, so think of yourself as an interconnected person and everybody that you're interacting with. So, you know, we're all shaped by our experiences and we are reliant on others to help us be successful. So if we can build that perspective of, I'm not here to do it alone. There are people that can help me. Um, it's so important to be able to reach out and not be heroic in an independent effort. Your success will multiply dramatically as a result. I hope that's you know, a, a good final end. to this. No, I see. I see it in our business. When you job slip because you think you need to be Superman, other things crater. That's not you need well oiled machine with systems and the appropriate people filling in when, when something happens. So I think that that's a beautiful point. Now, we, we've spoken a lot about long termism, but I do want to hear more about coaching international and and what you'll have to offer. So CEO coaching international, we're a 14 year old business. Um, we've coached over a thousand CEOs and companies, some of which are very well recognized names that we started with, like Taskus, who we started coaching when they were six million dollars in revenue. They now have a four billion dollar value on NASDAQ. Uh, incredible story. Um, we, I was speaking to a, a, an incredible seven year client of ours yesterday, a, a woman who makes uh, renewable batteries for solar backup and for car charging backup. When she started with us, 30 million in revenue, her run rate this year, 380 million. And I asked her, what benefit did you get from the relationship with us? And this is what we get consistent, consistently from our clients. You helped us develop accountability, disciplines on rhythm, and you really made us focus on are we accomplishing the results we set out to? Or are we kidding ourselves? Um, and, you know, so that's what we do. We have 64 highly seasoned CEOs, all of whom have run $100 million plus businesses. Some of them took a business from 20 million to 170 million. Some of them have run multi billion dollar divisions of companies like Mercedes Benz and Procter and Gamble. But they have one thing in common they have the wisdom. They have the scars of having been there and done that. Mm. And they're committed to the success of our, of our clients. They're not, no longer get any satisfaction about 
of running a big business. What they want is to impact the leadership, the growth, and the success of the business so that it, in the beginning of the call, so that anybody at any given point in time, when they decide to sell that business, they are going to create a generational wealth opportunity for themselves, their families, and their employees. And I don't think there's a company in the world that comes close to doing what we do. There are thousands of coaches, millions, lifestyle coaches, coaches on that. We are very disciplined. We send in our results, by the way, of our, our client results every year, revenue growth and profitability growth, EBITDA. We, this year, we just got our stats and we compared them to the NYU School of Business. If you stay <laughs> you with smoked us, them, didn't you? We smoked them. If you stay with us for two years, we our clients are doing four times the national EBITDA average and two times the revenue average. And I know your audience are serious bottom line people. That's what we're able to accomplish with our clients. If you stick with us and you actually execute on the deliverables that we set out for you, with you, Beautiful. by the way. Beautiful. Love that. And the website? Website, ceocoaching.com. ceocoaching.com. And our book, Making Big Happen, bestseller. You'll find it really practical. Enjoy it. Wonderful. Hey, this has been a treat. Really, really appreciate your time today, Sean. And uh, and Gino, maybe next time we'll get you to start on time. You know, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I got to give you a little something there. And so. guys, when you come to Dallas, and this is this is this will be my pleasure. Please be my guest. Let's go break bread. I'll invite my buddy Rick Sapio, and we'll have some fun. I would love that. Thank you. Done and done. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a good good rest of the day. Take care.